Hello, Christ Church. Yes, my name is Paul Fowler. I serve as our Lake Forest campus pastor. So good to see all of you here today. Welcome to those of you watching online and over in the 01. And a special welcome to any of you that are visiting us here today. I am so glad that you're with us. We'd love to have you back next week. Our senior pastor, Mike Woodruff, will be continuing our series in Exodus. Fake it till you make it. Have you heard this line before? Uh, This is what we tell ourselves or we tell other people when we've been given this job that we don't We don't know how to do it. Uh, But rather than saying research and figure it out, fake it till you make it rhymes and it sounds good. So we just get out there and do it. Maybe you've had this in a job where uh, you are about to get a promotion and they say, can you do all these things? And you want that promotion, you want that raise. And so you're like, yeah, I can do all those things. And you fake it till you make it. Uh, Also, if you're uh, interviewing for a job, you know, here's all the stuff, and you assume they'll train me how to do all these things, but you, you kind of fake it till you make it. I think some people have taken this to heart too much. Uh, now it's kind of fake it, lie on your resume until you get fired or kicked out of office. Uh, it doesn't seem to be working out too well. I don't think that's how fake it till you make it works. You don't want it in writing. Uh, but I am very thankful that one of the jobs you really can't do this is all is the medical community. You know, they've taken on do no harm, not Fake it till you make it. Good luck out there. And you'll get better as you do more of these brain surgeries. It's not how it works. We don't really want people out there faking it till they make it. But we kind of have to do this. So a few ways that I think we've probably all been there is maybe for those of you that uh, are currently in the dating world. No one reads a book on dating. Maybe you have. Uh, but my guess is most people have probably dated more people than books that they've read. So you just kind of fake it till you make it. You just put up the right pictures on your profile and say the right things and hopefully you fake it till you get married and then all of life's problems are solved (laughs) because you're married. But see, in marriage, we also do this same thing. We're not reading books on marriage. Maybe you had a little bit of counseling. It's kind of fake it till you make it. You've never been married to someone before or maybe you have and this one will be better, whatever it works. We kind of fake it till we make it because the person we're married to did not come with an instruction manual for all their weird quirks and problems. Uh, Neither did we. Uh, We also have our weird quirks. So we just kind of fake it and hope we don't blow it up. Parenting, this is another way that we fake it till we make it. Still remember about 13 years ago when I drove home from the hospital with my first kid. My friends could have saw, saw me. They would have said, who gave Paul Fowler a baby? This, this is not a good idea. It's my wife's fault. She gave me the baby, so it's okay. Um, but as parents, I know you've all been there where, what do we do with these kids? How do we take care of them? I'm not a medical professional. I'm assuming you're not on the short list. If someone had an extra baby, they would say, take this baby and you can have it, right? Like these aren't things we're good at, but we have to do these things. Life is full of these things that we feel like we kind of have to fake it till we make it. My assumption is that as we think about our relationship with God, we probably are feeling in that same place. Maybe not confidently certain of everything the Bible says, how we're supposed to do everything as it comes to our relationship with God. And so we come here once a week and we kind of fake it till we make it. Now, we're not a church that requires, you know, sitting, standing, kneeling, get up, do this, say these words. It's really easy to fake it here. Some of you might be faking it right now. You look like you're listening. You could even close your eyes and make it just be like, oh, I I think they're really listening to the sermon. But when life gets hard, is fake it till you make it going to work? When you don't know what to do with your kids. When your marriage is struggling. Relationships aren't working out. Difficulties at work. How are we going to know how to do everything we're supposed to do as it relates to God and what he's done for us? That's why it's so helpful for us to know and understand who Jesus is and what he did for us. And and to do that, we actually have to go back to the Old Testament. We've been walking through the book of Exodus. Because if we don't understand these important details here, it doesn't help us understand what Jesus has done for us in the cross in the New Testament. So turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 28. You can reach under your pew there. There's a Bible there, page 116. We're going to look at Exodus 28. And whenever you're studying the Bible, I say this every time I preach, you got to know what genre you're in. This is Old Testament history. Uh, This is in the Torah, the first uh, books of the Bible. And so 
what happens when you're looking at this? And, and some of you probably have been feeling this for the last few weeks. Look, we spent 30 minutes on curtains, 30 minutes, 30 minutes on an altar, and today we're 30 minutes on the priestly garments. I'm sure you're excited that this is what you came for today, but it's important to understand. And when you're studying this part of the Bible, what you really need to look for is how does this part, this detail, this important thing, show up in the New Testament? Because if we can see why God is telling us these things now, there's no things that are just throwaway things in the Bible. It is, it is a unified purpose pointing us to Jesus Christ. If we can look at these details, we can understand how we don't have to fake it till we make it when it comes to our relationship with God. So look with me, if you will, Exodus chapter 20, and I'm going to start in verse 2. Make sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honor. Tell all the skilled workers to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron for his consecration so he may serve me as priests. These are the garments that they are to make. These are what we're going to walk through today. A breast piece, an ephod, a robe, a woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. They are to make these sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his son so that they may serve me as priests. So these garments, and we have a picture of them that we can put up here on the screen. This is what we're going to walk through today. This is what the priests, this is not a photo of it. This is a uh, drawing uh, from a few hundred years ago, what we think it looks like, because we don't really know, because people don't wear these garments today. But today we're going to walk through each of these part of the garments so you can understand who Jesus is and what he did for us. So first part that we're going to go ahead and look at is in the next part, we're going to talk about the ephod. I'm actually going to point at it so you know exactly what I'm describing here. So I always thought the ephod was the golden part that's up there. We'll to get to that in just a moment. But it's this blue and red and finely twisted kind of linen that's put together. And we're going to look here at verse 6 that explains what the purpose of the ephod is. Make the ephod of gold and of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and a finely twisted linen, the work of skilled hands. It is to have two shoulder pieces attached to its corners so it can be fastened. Its skillfully woven waistband is to be like it, of one piece with the ephod and made with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen. So it was that red and blue and white part of the garment that they're wearing on the outermost part. That was the ephod. The next part that we're going to look at is the two memorial stones that were going to be at the shoulders on the top there. It's kind of hard to see, but there was two stones that were up there. And look with me at verse 9 on what these stones serve the purpose of. Take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel in the order of their birth, six names on one stone and the remaining six on the other. Engrave the names of the sons of Israel on the two stones the way a gem cutter engraves a seal. Then mount the stones in gold filigree set in and fasten them on the shoulder piece of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. Aaron is to bear the names of his shoulders as a memorial before the Lord. So these are the parts of the ephod, this red, white, blue garment that they're wearing, and then these memorial stones that had the tribes of Israel on the top of it. And again, this was to bring them dignity and honor, as we saw in verse 2 and 3, as a priest. Now let's talk about the breast piece, this next part here. Zoomed in on it nicely. We have an amazing uh, design team here. So you'll see that there is 12 different stones that are part of this. This is the breast piece that was a part of the ephod. What purpose does this play? Let's look at verse 15. Fashion a breast piece for making decisions. The work of skilled hands. Make it like the ephod of gold and of blue, purple and scarlet yarn and of finely twisted linen. It is to be square, a span long and a span wide, it's about nine by nine inches, and fold double. Then mount four rows of precious stones on it. The first row shall be, disclaimer, I'm better at Bible names than precious stones, so my apologies, uh, carnelian, chrysolite, and beryl. The second row shall be turquoise, lapis lazuli, and emerald. The third row shall be jacinth, agite, and amethyst. And the fourth row shall be topaz, onyx, and jasper. Mount them in gold filigree settings. There are to be 12 stones, one for each of the names of the sons of Israel with an engraved like seal with the name of the tribes. So on this golden breast piece they would wear, 
this nine by nine square that they would put onto the ephod. It had these 12 different stones. One had a name for each of the different tribes of Israel. And what it says there when we read verse 15, that this breast piece is for what? It was to help them make decisions. How did that help them make decisions? Well, there's another part that I can't show you. It's not really pictured. It, it was what they called the Urim and the Thummim. There's a lot of mystical thoughts about what these things actually were. Some think they were bones. Some think that they were stones. Uh, but they also served the purpose in some way of allowing the priest to make decisions. To demonstrate that, look with me over at verse 29. Whenever Aaron enters the holy place, he will bear the names of the sons of Israel over his heart on the breastpiece of decision as a continuing memorial before the Lord. Also put the Urim and the Thummim in the breastpiece. So they may be over Aaron's heart whenever he enters the presence of the Lord. Thus Aaron will always bear the means of making decisions for the Israelite over his heart before the Lord. So two different times it mentions that this breast piece that was on the ephod was to allow them to make decisions. And Urim, which could mean light, and Thummim, which could mean perfection. Again, we're not really sure. This is one of those details that's being described to us, but not prescribed to us. Not saying that we need to get Urim and Thummim and figure out how we make decisions, as much as this is what was given to the priest who would stand before God so they could help in making those decisions. It was an important part. And Mike's going to be talking more about this next week. But what you'll see is this ephod with the breast piece shows up a few different times in the book of Judges. And the people there actually started to worship this ephod as kind of a tangible way to see God, but they didn't use it for connecting with God. They didn't use it for make decisions. David uses the ephod when he goes to the priest and said, should I attack the Philistines or not? And somehow the ephod would tell them which way to go through the voice of God. It helps them make decisions. Next part that we're going to talk about is the priestly robes. And on the screen, you'll see the robe, which is in blue. And then at the bottom, this is important, there were a bunch of bells, which is hard for you to see, that were all around the robe. What is the purpose of this robe? Why the bells? Look at verse 31. Make the robe of the ephod entirely of blue cloth, with an opening for the head in its center. There shall be a woven edge like a collar around the opening so that it will not tear. Make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet round around the hem of the robe with gold bells between them. The gold bells and the pomegranates are to alternate around the hem of the robe. Aaron must wear it when he ministers. The sound of the bells will be heard when he enters the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out so that he will not die. I'm not sure why. These bells are important, but as this priest enters into the most holy place, it was not to be casually stroll in without some level of announcement that you're about to be in the very presence of God. So these bells were there as they would walk in and as they would walk out. Otherwise, the holiness of God was too much for anybody to comprehend that they would, they would die. It would be unholy in the way that they're doing it. The next part we'll look at here is on his head. You see this turban, this hat, and on there it says, holy is the Lord. What does this turban do? What's the point of this? Look at verse 36. Make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it as a seal, holy to the Lord. Fasten a blue cord to it, attach it to the turban. It is to be on the front of the turban. It will be on Aaron's forehead, and he will bear the guilt involved in the sacred gifts the Israelites consecrate whatever their gifts may be. It will be on Aaron's forehead continually so that they will be acceptable to the Lord. So on Aaron's head, in wearing this hat, if he didn't wear the hat, any sacrifice he offered would not actually work. It didn't actually mean anything. Because in offering that sacrifice in some interesting way, the guilt was actually put on his head. That salvation could not come unless he's wearing this helmet, that God would now make this sacrifice acceptable. There's a purpose for every part of this garment. Every part of it brings the dignity and the honor that was needed. And you see that it says that again down in verse 40. It lists out all these different parts of the garments, and it's repeated at the beginning of the chapter and at the end here, so we know this is why the garments are helpful. It gives dignity and honor. What we aren't going to show you, I don't have a picture of, is verse 42. It talks about the linen undergarments. Um, he's wearing the undergarments there. We don't have a picture of them. 
Uh, and that was also important because you could not come into the presence of God not being completely and fully dressed to the details that God had required. And then you look down at the last verse, verse 43. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants. Now, my assumption is that most of you have not seen anybody ever wearing one of these garments. So if this is to be a lasting ordinance, where are they? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to not end up in a world of faking it till we make it if we don't have a person or a place that we can come to and say, oh yes, this is the holy garments, you stand in the presence of God. Perhaps for some of you, as we've been walking over these details over the last few months, you might feel envious in the sense of, wouldn't it be great if we had a place to go to, and like Israel had, God would appear in a cloud or he would appear in a pillar of fire, a place that as you drove in today over the parking lot or over the building, there was a place that you could say, God is right there. And we know that God is everywhere, but my assumption is when we tell you that it feels practically in your life and everything that you're going through, that God is somehow nowhere, that there's not a tangible place that you can go and see. And then you look around, I'm clearly not wearing priestly garments. I did find it on Amazon for about 60 bucks. Not going to wear it. Uh, you might say, well, are you our priest? Uh, do we come to you? And, and maybe you would love a place that you could come to. And you would bring your sacrifice, and there would be an individual transaction. You come in, you talk to the priest. The priest would say, how long till your last sacrifice? And then we go, and we do this whole thing. And, but that's just not how it works here. And so you might feel you're on your own as you come in here today, and you're on your own when you leave here today. So maybe that's why we feel like we have to fake it till we make it. Some of you might not know this, but uh, from 2016 to 2019, I served as our director of finance here as, at Christ Church. And in 2019, I took a job on the south side of Chicago with the church who had purchased a 100-year-old church building, 30,000 square foot, Everything was part, falling apart on us. It was in violation from the city for some of the terracotta falling off. And water was just pouring through the roof and this 50-foot stained glass dome that was falling apart. No heat, no air conditioning, nothing. And they said to me, would you help us fundraise and kind of be our owner's agent on the property? Now, that means I'm not the general contractor for the work. I am the accountant that makes sure everybody gets paid and in some sense helps us find the architect and general contractor. And so we did find an architect, and they say the cost for this church to remodel was going to be not $8 million, like we were fundraising towards and had asked about, but $12 million. Now, we didn't have an extra $4 million laying around, so we had to find a way to value engineer to cut down some of the costs, and we were able to do it in two ways. First, we cut out $2 million of stuff we weren't able to do. And then on the other side, we said, well, we will have... Paul, the accountant, um, the owner's agent, be somewhat of a general contractor and bring some other trades in to help us do these things. Now, they knew I wasn't qualified, was not lying, was not trying to fake it till I make it here. Uh, but for the construction workers bringing in, I kind of did. You know, I bought my hat online, so I looked like just all the other construction people. It was great. I think I played the part really well. And there was this one time we had to put these giant mechanical units from a big crane, you know, 40 feet up in the air onto the roof of this building, and the general contractor that we worked with organized a meeting. So it is me, the owner's agent, I have power because I represent the money in this project, and then they have a project manager, and they have a project lead, and they have a safety coordinator, and they have the crane operator, they have a site foreman, they have the person who's gonna deliver the cranes. All these people are here in the meeting. And I look like all of them. I didn't have a vest like they did, but I had my construction hat. And in some sense, the project worked seamless because I wasn't in charge. Actually, the general contractor was in charge. But he made me look good, like I you know, knew what I was doing, but that's what we had paid him for to do. And the day comes, and the site foreman clears off the street, and the safety coordinator's got everything under wraps, and the crane shows up and sets up, and at just the right time, the mechanical units show up, and they put it on the roof. It was beautiful. And I just spent my time taking pictures and you know, patting myself on the back. Good job. There was another time, though, that I was responsible for <clears throat> replacing all the windows on this building. And so we got to get a pallet of new windows 
up to the top floor. But this time, it's not on the general contractor, it's on me. I didn't have the cool meeting of everybody there. I didn't have a safety coordinator, no project lead. It's just me, the window guy, and the crane guy. And the window guy starts setting up his ladders, and they're climbing up to the roof. Doesn't look safe. No one got hurt. It's all good. The crane guy shows up, and he's ready to put the pallet up there. And over the roar of the crane, he says to me, just make sure I don't hit the power lines. We didn't establish signals. I, I don't know what this guy wants me to tell him. Like, is this bad or good? You know, what do we do if it's not working? Fake it till you make it doesn't work. Now, thankfully, this guy was totally okay, completely fine. It all worked out. But I can say from personal experience, that's not the place that you want to live at, where we know there's things we have to get done, but we just don't know how to do it. So when it comes to our relationship with God, when it comes to our understanding of the priesthood, what are we supposed to do? How do we not lean into fakeness, but we look at God's word and understand what we are supposed to do. Well, before we leave today, I want to give you three different ways that I think we can understand the priesthood in light of Jesus, our high priest, and what he's done for us. And the first point is this. Jesus, our high priest, has made salvation for us. It's not fake it till you get saved. Jesus, our high priest, has made salvation for us. To demonstrate that, I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. It's page 1714 in your pew Bibles there if you're following along. And as I mentioned before, when you look at these details in the Old Testament, find where they show up again in the New Testament so we can understand the purpose and the plan behind each and every detail here. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away any sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now, for some of you, you might be saying, I get it, we can't save ourselves. It is only a work of Jesus. But you have to hear this again and again and again because it is easy to drift into what are the things I have to do so that God might will love me more? What are the things I have to do to view myself as good? Rather than understanding that the reason that we don't have a priest every day is because we have our high priest in heaven who has offered one sacrifice for all time. In fact, none of those other sacrifices really meant anything in, until Jesus ultimately paid that price on the cross. And it's easy for us to go back into the law, which is the, the items that make demands on us. And the law is not bad. The law is, is good in helping us understand there is a perfect God. There is a perfect way to live. And the law helps us understand we've missed the mark. We will not be good enough. Jesus, our high priest, has offered one sacrifice for all time, and now he's sitting up in heaven because the work is finished. The work is complete. And in fact, it says there in verse 14, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. If you confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you're already made perfect. There's no work to be done. There's no matter of trying to get here perfect attendance that somehow you're going to earn God's favor or earn God's love. Now, there are opportunities. We come to church to learn and to grow, but we do not come as if God might somehow love us more by the things that we do. You have been made perfect. And you have to hear this again and again because it's easy to drift into what do I need to do that God might listen to me, that God might hear me, that God might understand me. Folks, it's complete. Jesus, our high priest, has made salvation for you. Do you believe that? Do you live in light of that truth? What's been given to you? The second point is Jesus, our high priest, has made us part of the priesthood. Jesus, our high priest, has made us part of the priesthood. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. It's page 1,728 in your pew Bible there. I'll read it for you. <clears throat> Starting in verse 4 in 1 Peter chapter 2. As you come to him, the living stone, 
rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be what? A holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It's also mentioned in the book of Revelation. This might seem kind of shocking that you now are part of the priesthood. Jesus, our high priest, has made you part of the priesthood. You are made perfect. Now, perhaps you're looking at me and you're saying, but what's your job? You're the pastor here. Isn't that the modern-day equivalent of a priest? No, it's, it's not. My job as a pastor is actually... It, Pastor is listed of many of the different gifts, and you've all been given a gift. Pastor is one of those spiritual gifts that I've been given, and so I've been hired to pastor, which is shepherding, caring for others, which is teaching to some level. I am not a, a priest, and my job is not to serve as a priest. Mike Woodruff, our senior pastor, he is also a pastor that has the gift of teaching and shepherding but he also serves as an elder. An elder is an office at, at the church, which is an overseer of the church. And the elders were the ones entrusted with the care of the body, entrusted with the direction. I don't serve as an elder, so, and Mike does. But an elder is also not the modern day priest. Why? Because our high priest has completed his work in heaven. And you are part of the priesthood. And this is an important part for, under, for you to understand because in no way do you need to think of me at some level, and maybe you easily don't, that I am an intercessor or a, a priest before you as God. That's what priests were. They were intercessors. They were mediators. You would go to the priest and you would talk to them. They knew what to do. We, we don't do that anymore because you have every right and access before God that I do. You have every power and privilege that has been given because we are all part of that priesthood. So when we talked about this a few weeks ago with that curtain getting torn, and we are told this is shocking with confidence to walk into the most holy place, it's hard for us to get because you've never been likely to a tabernacle where there's been this holy place that you can't go into, and beyond that that you can't even see is a most holy place that you can't even get close to, but when that curtain is torn because of what Jesus has done, you can stroll on in confidently because you are made perfect and Jesus Christ. He wants to hear from you. The way I would think of it is, let's say you walk up to the CEO of your company and you stroll in the office and you just share whatever is on your mind. It's not going to work out well for you. But with God, you march right into his very presence because you are made perfect through Jesus Christ. He wants to hear from you. How many days do you get up and you confidently march into that presence saying, God, here's what's on my heart. Here's what's on my mind. How many days do you pick up his word and say, all right, God, here's what I'm seeing. Help me understand. Is this the truth? Is this the left, the right? Which way that I am supposed to go? Folks, you're part of the priesthood. God wants to hear from you. Do you embrace that confidence that you've been given? Third part is Jesus, our high priest, has made garments for us. And I want to turn to Ephesians chapter 6 which I think helps us really understand how we embrace our priesthood. Jesus, our high priest, has made garments for us. In Ephesians chapter 6, it's page 1,669 in your pew Bible, I'm going to start in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, this is the important part, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. The priests of the garments, they had that belt that they would put on. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. You know, they had that breast, place, breast piece that would tell them, this is the way to go. Which, how do you make decisions? Righteousness is that. What is the right way of doing things? How do I do this? This is the armor of God that we put on. Talks about your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. We don't need bells to walk into God's presence. We have peace with God, Romans says. 
In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, the part that the priesthood didn't even have. We have the shield of faith, which what? Extinguishes all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the turban that they would wear, that the guilt was on there. Our atonement, our salvation, our reminder that we are forever and eternally secured because we did not save ourselves. We were saved by Jesus Christ. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the very word of God. Oftentimes we don't talk as much about the armor of God. We do it a lot in Sunday school, but maybe for adults it feels a little bit, okay, getting a little spiritual here. Principalities and powers, what are all these things? This is why fake it till you make it doesn't work. There is this whole world that you are going through that you can't see, that you have a God who has given you, through Jesus Christ, everything you need to be prepared for every situation that you're going through. So if you're part of the priesthood, how often are you putting on the garments? the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation? How often do you take hold of these things that could help you move to a place that you understand Jesus has made it and he's done these things for us? How differently would you live? Knowing what our high priest has done for us, the confidence we have to come before him. And every day we have access to that power. Put on your garments. Be prepared. And Jesus has done that for us. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much that you are a high priest. Uh, you have done incredible work of securing our salvation on the cross. Thank you that you are seated right now at the throne of God, mediating on our behalf. But Holy Spirit, we ask for your help today, each and every one of us that is here today. Holy Spirit, guide us. Give us your strength. Give us your wisdom for what we don't even know how to do. And it is is in the name of our high priest, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.